Welcome to Westmont's Compelling Conversations. I'm Gail D. Beebe, president of Westmont College. In Compelling Conversations, I engage scholars, leaders, authors, and members of our community in discussions that inform us about essential issues and encourage us to take meaningful action. This is Gail Beebe, and it's my privilege to host another compelling conversation. Today, I have the privilege of interviewing Helen Park. For eight and a half years, Helen was my executive assistant, and at least one of us enjoyed all eight and a half years of that. uh, She was just a delight to have in the office. She is now the assistant director of human resources. She actually left the college for a year to get the certification, and I was just delighted when she was willing to come back in a different role. And this is a role that she'd actually dreamed about, and after she got married, uh, she's married to Aaron. I actually had the privilege of doing the ceremony, (laughs) which I still have a beautiful picture on my mantle uh, in my office. And then they have uh, one child that they're raising. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people would see it as a dog, uh, <laughs> and we know we know their child is Lucas. Yes. But uh, Helen, thank you for letting me interview you today. Mm-hmm. What interests me, uh, you have such a fascinating background, and when you were seven years old, you immigrated from South Korea. Uh, your older brother has been involved in the defense of our country, which is just fascinating. Uh, And I often uh, was just intrigued with what it had been like for you in terms of being born uh, and being old enough to actually remember uh, your country of origin and then coming here and having to basically remake your life and then uh, really live in two cultures and uh, just meeting your family, meeting your aunts and uncles, uh, you traveling back and forth to South Korea for different events was just always intriguing. And I was hoping that you'd be willing to talk with us today about that, of what is it like to actually restart your life here? What's it like to be bicultural and what you've learned uh, as a result of growing up in two worlds? Sure. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you. Growing up, so I do have, you know, little memories left of my time in Korea, but it's just, you know, snapshot of certain moments. But what I do remember is, you know, growing up in La Palma, um, we spoke Korean at home. We ate Korean food, you know, almost every meal. But our goal was to, you know, get used to our new lives here. So I think the goal was to assimilate. Yeah. And... At that time, you know, our goal was to go to school, be good students, and just learn what you can to make the life easier and, and, you know, quote unquote, better um, for our time here. So, you know, I was fortunate enough to attend a smaller schools. Uh, La Palma wasn't that busy, you know, in the um, early 90s. So my neighbors were really nice. We were one of the few um, Asian families within our immediate okay. uh, streets and neighbors. So they accepted us in a way that, you know, they're from Korea. And, you know, my parents, they do their best, but their English is not perfect. But we were welcomed in a way that any one of us could hope for. Yeah. So they would invite us to barbecues they would let us use their pool, you know, so we just... Did any of your family, did it, did any of the rest of your family come, or did they come later? Or? Sure, so my mom's older sister, she was already in Los Angeles. And is so. this the sister I would have met in yes. the hall here? Yeah. <laughs> so no, this that is was my delightful. LA aunt. Yeah. So she's been in the country, I want to say maybe at least 10 years prior yeah. to um, our arrival, and since... She retired and moved back home, so That's so we're right. the only ones um, left in, in the country. But, you know, so growing up, it was just learning how to fit in. Yeah. Um, you know, you do well in school, a lot of homework, but we had Korean school on weekends. We attended a Korean church, so I had this dual cultures that I was living in almost every day. Talk talk a little about Korean school. This always intrigued me, the way in which you kept your culture alive. Sure. So it was, I believe, Saturday mornings, and we would go to either 
a local community center, but it was you know held together by local churches. Yeah. So um, a lot of the students who were there were you know second generations mostly who were born here and they didn't know how to speak Korean or uh, adopted yeah. uh, Korean students whose non-Korean parents wanted them to learn about where they came from. So we would meet once a week. We had workbooks that we needed to <laughs> study so we would learn how to read and write and we would you know read books learn about different holidays different traditions but it was a big social gathering more like you know parents would just wait for us outside and if it was a particular holiday there would be a lot of food um, I think Korean cultures are very uh, hospitable and yeah. we celebrate through food and sharing of different menus and meals so you know there were plenty of snacks and specialty food items but we would learn how to read and write and my parents would make us read like a newspaper a korean newspaper well, how about uh, that? my dad would be like try reading that article <laughs> so you know <laughs> there were a lot of um corrections on pronunciation and I would go ahead and just turn it back to him and say, well, why don't you translate that into English? <laughs> um, I didn't like being corrected. But 30-some years later, I really appreciated them keeping me going for close to 10 years, I want to say. Um, it was harder to continue as our schedule got busier. But thinking back now, it really was a fun way to just keep that part of me going we hated it. It was just extra work. We didn't want to do <laughs> extra anything. Extra homework. Right. And it's Saturday. You don't want to, you know, do any work. But in hindsight, I really appreciated them. Are there parts of your Korean culture that you have introduced Aaron to and have kept alive in your marriage? You know, so Aaron actually decided to learn how to write and read Korean. Oh, how about that? So he's, that? he's not quite there with speaking, yeah. but he learned the all the alphabet and he can phonetically say things. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. So, you know, he's getting used to the Korean culture, you know, not only just us as a married couple, but just learning idiosyncrasies of my family. And <laughs> <laughs> um, he's a big cook. He, he enjoys cooking and he is the better cook between the two of us. So my mom actually teaches him how to cook certain things. Is that right? Yes. Oh, and, that's great. And what's interesting is Korean moms, or at least my mom, she doesn't have a written recipe for anything. So she's like, oh, you put just a little bit of this and a little bit of that. <laughs> you taste it and you'll know. But I like to follow the instruction meticulously. So Aaron um, meeting with my mom and just sort of, you know, tasting her food. And they talk about through, through you know, physical gestures and broken English and Korean um, they talk about how to make a certain dish. Oh, that's great. And I, I tell him that you're going to let my mom's recipe live on in our family because that's just not going to be me. Yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate him though. enjoying yeah. Korean food um, and not just Korean barbecue or some of the most popular uh, foods. But, you know, he loves kimchi and he likes things that, I didn't think he would try. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that we could share our love for food together. Now, you became a very accomplished clarinetist. <laughs> what drew you to that instrument? And, sure. And you pursued that. Uh, even isn't your master's degree in performance? Yes. Yes. So I learned the piano since I was really okay. young. Two of my aunts were, uh, they are pianists. So I got an early start on that. We have a very musical family on my dad's side and artistic family on my mom's side. So I loved playing the piano and I kept up with it. But when I was in elementary school, I just really got bored playing by myself. So we had an opportunity to pick an instrument to learn. And I actually tried cello for the first time in my fifth grade. And it was awful. It was terrible. I sounded terrible and my fingertips hurt. So I didn't want to do string instrument. But um, my next door neighbor, David, uh, David, who was one year older than me, he had just picked up clarinet the year before. And I thought, oh, that looks like a fun instrument. And if I practice hard enough, like David and I can like be in the same band together next year. <laughs> so 
um, I chose clarinet and my dad actually wanted me to play the flute and he said you know flute's so pretty and it's more feminine a lot of girls played the flute so why don't you play the flute but I said well since you want me to play the flute I don't want to play the flute <laughs> and I'm gonna play the clarinet so I chose the clarinet so that I could play with other people in an orchestra or yeah. a band and I really loved it I was fortunately good at it but I never really imagined pursuing it as, as a college uh, major. Um, until my senior year, I was struggling to see what am I going to yeah. school for? What do I want to study? And it just made sense to me. I'm good at it. I love it. And I want to learn more about it. And it was difficult for my parents to hear, you know, you don't want to be a music major. What kind of job are you going to have? Um, they wanted me to be a pharmacist. <laughs> Not even a doctor, <laughs> but I come from a culture. And once yeah. again, it's my family culture where a woman's success is, you know, evaluated based on the kind of marriage one might have and your children and your family. And my parents thought a pharmacist would be a good professional career, you know, respectful career, but also you can come home at night for your family. So pharmacist was what my parents wanted me to pursue and I was good in some of my science classes but I had to work really hard at it and that's just not where my passion yeah. was so I chose music major which is what I wanted and it's been great one might ask then why aren't you in a music career now <laughs> but you know I think being a music major really helped me be more disciplined and learn how to troubleshoot. You know, when you learn different pieces, you, you have to do your research and figure it out. So I think the, my training as a musician really um, helped me become more effective in what I do oh, in a professional great. setting. You are listening to Westmont's Compelling Conversations with President Gail D. Beebe. Now, I believe I remember this correctly, that your dad was actually born in what is now North Korea. Is that true? My dad was not, but his father was. His father yeah. was. Do you still have relatives in North Korea? You know, I'm sure we do, okay. but we no have contact. no, yeah, no whereabouts. Wow, that's just amazing. The your brother, mm -hmm. the the brother <laughs> that you have always admired and mm -hmm. loved. What drew him into the military? He's sure. in the U.S. military. Are yes. you allowed to talk about that? Um. Well, I don't know what he does exactly because he <laughs> just tells us that I keep you safe. So, nine eleven happened, yeah. and actually, even before my brother did consider. Um, enlisting okay. during his high school. Oh, how about that? Okay. And my parents said, no, no, you know, you have to go to college. You have to go to college. And 9-11 happened, and he was affected by it, I yeah. think. And I think he wanted to just do something. And my brother is really sensitive, and he's smart. But in hindsight, he probably has adult ADHD okay. that probably was just undiagnosed or, you know, we didn't even know right. those things. So he wasn't the best student. And as a student, like your job is to do well. Right. So he did have some issues with my parents um, not doing so well in school because he's so smart, but he just didn't try hard enough, or at least that's what my parents thought, that he's not applying himself. Didn't turn in his homework on time. Right, yeah. right. And he just didn't try as hard, or that's what they thought. But I think he probably was too bored. He would read everything and anything, and he'll get in trouble for that because he's not doing his homework. But he would pick up an encyclopedia, and he'll just start reading. And he just has a lot of information. Hey, well, just uh, <laughs> incessant curiosity. Right, yeah. right. But I think just us growing up in the 90s yeah. and our parents probably not understanding how to 
I'm not understanding the American school system as well as what is going on, you know, during his teen days. Yeah. Um, I think he just thought what it was his duty to maybe serve the country, but also leave home. Yeah. <laughs> And so that was the easiest yeah. way to solve both. Yeah, that was. And we're so proud of him. And, oh, you know, we joked about, like, he's not going to even make it through the boot camp. You know, <laughs> I mean, we had to wake him up every morning to get him to get ready for school. And we thought, he's not even going to make it. How is he going to do it? But the military has been really good for him. And he just uh, celebrated his 20 years um, career. And he retired last amazing. summer. So, yeah, so we were so proud of him. And I really hope he can start his second career and just do what he really wants to do and just pursue that curiosity and see where yeah. it lands. So let's go back to one of the happiest days of your life. Yes. Your wedding right here <laughs> on campus in the formal gardens. And the, uh, we have that moment in the ceremony where you have turned your facing Aaron and Lucas feels left out. <laughs> And it is one of the cutest moments ever in all the weddings I've ever done where Lucas, how old is Lucas? Lucas just turned 14 two weeks ago. So and Lucas is my dog. Lucas, yes, <laughs> not her son, but her dog, whom she loves like a son. And Lucas, you can tell, is just not sure he likes Aaron. <laughs> and he elbows his way in between yes. you and Aaron as you're getting ready to recite vows. Talk about your love of animals generally mm -hmm. and this special love you have for your dog. Because I actually think Lucas is adorable and I, <laughs> I love the way you love your dog. Sure. Um, I've always loved animals, not just dogs or cats, but all animals. I really um, love all God's creations. But I got Lucas 14 years ago. He's a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. And Lucas came into my life, I think, during one of the hardest times of my life so I think yeah. I just had that immediate connection with him but through my dog I really you know felt the true meaning of love and I know it yeah. sounds cheesy but that unconditional yeah. love um, I, I feel that through my dog and I think it sort of let me in on how my parents feel about me and you know how I feel about my partner, um, but also how Jesus loves me. Yeah. So he's not perfect and he does naughty things, but you know, I'm annoyed at him at the moment, but I don't hate him <laughs> or I don't not love him. So yeah. I think what I learned through raising my 14 year old dog is just that meaning of unconditional love yeah. and what it means um, in my family and how it relates through my faith. So yeah, it's, He's got some health issues. We thought, you know, we would lose him about a year yeah. ago, but he's held on, and it, it's it's hard. He's not himself, and he does have um, some mobility issues and some other concerns, but he's the love of my life, and <laughs> it's great well, to I, see I him really, every day. I, I mean, it, it actually, I remember it, how it awakened in me an understanding mm -hmm. of... You, know, you hear this term, a comfort or companion yeah. animal, and it's really true. Yeah. I mean, that people who have that kind of, of interaction with, mm -hmm. a, especially a dog as responsive as, yeah. as Lucas, it, it really is comforting and, yeah. and reassuring, real companionship. And he's such a strong communicator, too. I mean, he doesn't obviously say anything, but through his eyes and his movements and little barks here and there, it's just amazing yeah, and you... I feel so connected and you know he's so loyal and doesn't disappoint me in any yeah. way so you know when I do have a hard day I just go home and he he just knows somehow so he'll sit next to me and just let me um, pet him and smother him so we're, we're coming to the end you've <laughs> held up so beautifully the I'd like you to talk about your time at Westmont mm -hmm. and what's been a highlight what's been a challenge and what's an enduring memory oh wow well the highlight is the people here you know this is my 14th year and oh, I great. didn't think I would be here for so long it's such a privilege <laughs> So I love this community and my desire was to give back in a way that made me feel so invested and valued. So, you know, especially 
my new role in HR. Yeah. I get to talk to current employees and you know community members about Westmont as well as potential future community members uh, during our uh, recruiting process. So to talk about what a great community this is is the biggest joy of my life. And I would say that really is the highlight of my job. The only thing I don't like is that I don't get to see you as often. <laughs> that really is the downside. Well, bless you. Um, Thank you. The challenge, I think, is how can I contribute in a way that everyone feels heard hmm. and seen and valued as I have yeah. had here. So creating those you know, opportunities or a space for other people to have that experience. Yeah. And I would love to do more and learn more on how I can be part of that. And I do hear through student life and some of my colleagues that students of color um, don't always feel like they belong here. Yeah. And that really breaks my heart. And I say, I'm here, I'm available. They can come and see me, but I am not out there reaching out and just being myself available. So that's something that I would love to just work on because I would love to know what their experiences yeah. are like because I personally had a great experience from the moment I walked in here as a music department assistant. So I've had four different jobs here, but each job was so rewarding. And I really felt like everyone supported me to be my best and do my best. And I do want to be and do my best all the time. So, you know, I would love to share my positive experience, but also learn from what others might have experienced and if there are ways in which I can um, be of support or just learn from so that, you know, we can learn more about each other because that's what makes this community so wonderful. It's the different people with, with commonalities. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, Helen, you're a wonderful part of the community. Oh. <laughs> I love the eight and a half years that you were my executive assistant and and love the fact that you're back in a role that you really dreamed of and went out and got additional education so you could do. <laughs> Helen Park, let me give my best effort. Kam Sami Da. Oh, Kam Sami Da. Thank Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. Join us next time for another compelling conversation with President Gail D. Beebe.